All right, everyone, I'm going to talk to you today about the Canterbury Tales. Um, it's a collection of stories um, written by Geoffrey Chaucer. We've been leading up to uh, this ever since we started the Middle Ages. So let's get started. All right. Uh, first of all, like I said, this was written by Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, <clears throat> he really began to elevate the respectability of the English language because he started writing stories in English. You've got to remember back when we talked about the Middle Ages that the predominant um, languages spoken by uh, nobles or clergy was French and Latin and he really elevated the idea of the English language because he started writing these great works in English uh, before then it was just kind of viewed as like a, uh, a commoner's language um, and he really helped to elevate the, the connotation of, of English language Anyway, so he talks about um, Canterbury Tales as a framed story. Um, it's like there's a bigger story going on, and then there's a bunch of little stories inside it. Okay, so um, the idea is this. Let me, just, let me just give you a brief thing. There are people that are on a pilgrimage. Okay, and a pilgrimage is considered to be a holy journey. There are a group of people that are on their way to see Thomas Beckett's tomb. Remember, we just finished talking about Thomas Beckett and how he became sort of a, um, a saint because he was, he, mar he was martyred. He became a martyr for a cause uh, when he defied King Henry. So they're on their way to see his tomb. Back in this time... When people had means to travel, they would often travel to go see a religious uh, site. And in this case, it was Thomas Beckett's tomb. It goes as such, like they are on a trip and they stop at an inn. And to entertain themselves, each person tells a story. Like goes around a circle or however they do it and they each tell a story. But before they tell a story there is a description of each character, and that's called the general prologue, okay? All right, so he never actually finished it, but it's still considered to be, like, one of the greatest works in the English language. Um, he uses a different cadence when he speaks, and what I mean by that is, like, a, a different beat. Um, he uses what's called iambic pentameter, um, that goes away from the Anglo-Saxon way of telling stories. I want to remind you that Beowulf was a story that was told orally for hundreds of years. It was never written down for quite some time. And we talked about how it had a different sound to it because it was meant to be a production, right? It was meant to be entertaining. And so they had different a different cadence or a different rhythm to the way they told the story. But in this case, um, Chaucer tells it much as he speaks. There's a lot less pomp and circumstance surrounding uh, the way it's told. Rather, it's just told merely like you and I would tell a story. And since um, the predominant rhythm of the English language and the way we speak is iambic pentameter, uh, so the story is as well. All right, um, <clears throat> the prologue, as we will call it, is the part that really begins it all as far as the character description. Remember that I told you that this is a satire, and you need to pay careful attention to the way that Geoffrey Chaucer describes the characters, and then... As you read the tales that the characters tell themselves, you can see sometimes a contradiction or a reinforcement of the assumptions of those characters. This is a way to kind of indict society for problems that it has. 
But the prologue um, is that funny thing that I read to you in class as we got started, right? Um, and the reason it sounds so funny is because it's really written in Middle English. And so it sounds like it's close to us, but not quite. And you can kind of decipher it, but not quite. And that's because it's it's Middle English and it hasn't quite reached uh, what we call modern English uh, for us to understand thoroughly today. Anyhow, why don't you go ahead and pause this and I want you to read uh, this part of the prologue really quick. All right, let's move on. This is all the, these are all the characters in the prologue, okay? Um, <clears throat> they are um, 29 if you count the guild. Now, I want you to see on this Prezi where it says that um, they are journeying to Canterbury to the shrine of St. Thomas. It's St. Thomas Beckett, okay? So, don't get, don't get that confused. I know... For the most part, when we covered it, we just called him Beckett. So, remember that it's Thomas Beckett. Okay? So, 29 pilgrims, they're all on journey. And on their journey, they stop at an inn that can hold everybody. And the host of the, of the inn, of the hotel, essentially, says, Hey, let's have a competition to entertain ourselves. Each person tells a story. And whoever tells the best story, they can have, like, you know, a free meal or something. And so, they're all telling, trying to tell really good stories. Um, <clears throat> let's get started. So, you have the knight. If you're going to choose to listen to the knight, um, then you wait here. Uh, if not, you're going to be able to move past him. Because what I want you to do is to pick five characters to listen about. Um, you may go through each, and let me back it back up for you so you can see the choices. If you want to pause it here and look at the choices, or if you want to look on your handout and see the choices, you can do that as well. But you need to have listened to five characters. All right. Sorry about the confusion. All right. So, the knight. He is really distinguished. Um... He is a well-known and well-traveled knight. Uh, people know him, know of him, I would say. Um, he's very truthful. Um, he, he believes in being truthful. He believes in freedom and chivalry and honor, uh, as, as many knights do, but he actually lives it. Um, he's not boastful. He is definitely the highest social rank of all of the people on the trip, all the pilgrims. I want you to know this. He has very modest clothing. Um, he actually has the money to get some really nice clothing. He can afford better, but he doesn't feel the need to get better. Like, there's like, it even talks about how there's, like, on his shirt, there's a stain. So, um... <clears throat> He really could be um, better dressed or and have finer things, but he's very humble and very kind. So he that's like that's just not something that he's very concerned with. He's not concerned with looks. He is really going to serve as the quote unquote ideal Christian for the pilgrims. Okay, so you're going to see some people who are kind of bad or they have flaws. Remember, they may represent one of the seven deadly sins. But the knight really stands out as um, being an example of an ideal Christian. Okay, let's move on to the squire. If you want to listen to the squire, so be it. If not, you can wait for something else or, you know, fast forward, pick, pick the ones you want. Um, so the squire, he is the squire to the knight in the story, the one we just talked about. Um, he is, he serves the knight and he learns. That's the whole point of a squire. Um, however, he is very, he has like curly hair and he has like real flashy clothes. Um, you know, it says he wears red and white with the, and there's like flowers embroidered on it. 
Um, <clears throat> so he seems to be very vain uh, about his appearance. He considers himself to be a ladies' man. Uh, this would later on in, um, an, in another century later would be referred to uh, as like a being a Casanova, right? He's some, he, you know, a, a Renaissance man, so to speak. He, and that just means he has the ability to do a lot of things like um, sing, play the flute, write, you know, songs and poetry, you know, someone who could ride well on a horse, a knight in training, but educated, you know, a, a man of all things. Um, that's what's known uh, all things uh, that I guess you could say that were considered to be noble, okay? And so that would make him sort of a Renaissance man, and he thought very highly of himself. Okay, moving on to the Yaoman. Yaoman, not Yeoman, Yaoman. Um, <clears throat> the Yaoman is uh, a servant also to the knight, but also to the squire in this situation. He basically travels with them and helps them take care of things. Um, so he dresses mostly in green and he carries a long bow, like a bow and arrow. Um, he is just an expert woodsman. This is a guy who's good in the woods, okay? He probably, most likely, his role with, along with, you know, just duties of care for the knight and the squire, he probably a lot of his role is like get, you know, getting food while they're out for battle, um, taking care of things like that. He dresses probably mostly in green just to represent like how he is, uh, um, you know, he's in the woods a lot. So he probably would want to have, uh, it's, it's kind of like having his own version of camouflage. Okay. But he's basically an expert woodsman. It says, um, that he is quote unquote brown like a nut uh, in the prologue, which means he's probably tan because he's been outside a, a quite a bit. He's an outdoors guy. Um, he wears a medal around his neck of Saint Christopher. He uh, ha he's he's really strong. He's very loyal. Um, he has really nice arrows that are made from peacock feathers. Um, he is an excellent, excellent shot. He may also be slightly concerned with his appearance, especially since his arrows have, like, fancy peacock feathers. But um, that's that's really about all it is. He, This is the guy that, um, you know, sometimes gets compared to Robin Hood, okay? That whole idea of him being... Um, a woodsman and, and, and good with a bow. Now we have the prioress. Um, the prioress is just a rank within being a nun, okay? And her name is Madame Eglantine. She is very well educated and um, very like gentle in the way of like knowing the proper way to behave, not gentle like easy. Um, <clears throat> she is big, big, big on etiquette and manners. She wants people to notice that she has good etiquette. Um, she goes through a lot of care to look really nice and to eat very nice. Like, you know, again, following the proper like dinner etiquette, things like that. Um, she really has, she like wears this gold brooch and it says, like the gold brooch has an inscription on it that says Amor Vincent Omino, and I hope I pronounced that right, but it just means love conquers all, uh, which is kind of worth noting because she's a nun and and just to remind you, during this time especially, uh, nuns, monks, friars, they have taken a vow of poverty, right? So that all things go to God, right? They don't collect material possessions because all things should go to further the kingdom of God. But it's odd that she has this gold brooch and then it says love conquers all. You would think a nun would have something that says, you know, God conquers all. Um, but anyway, she tries to be, she tries to pin her nun 
habit or her clothing uh, in such a way that it is appealing on her body. And she even has, like, wears lipstick. Um, she does speak French, but it's known that it's not the particular grouping of French that is of the nobles, okay? But she's very proper. She's very concerned with what people think about her and having courtly manners. All right. Um, with the prioress, there are three other characters who are traveling with her in a group. Um, it's like an, another nun and three priests. And um, th they have, uh, it, there's one that is like a beast fable that's about Chanticleer. All right, then you have the monk. Uh, he really loves to hunt. Um, he eats lots of fine foods, like very expensive foods. Um, he has really nice clothing, um, probably, um, you know, very well kept up. It's trimmed in fur. Um, he's, you know, considered to be rather fat and jolly and bald, um, which is a really positive way to put him. But I think there's an emphasis here on the fact that he has taken a vow of poverty. Um, <clears throat> And so there's a question as to why he has this fine clothing and why he's eating these fine foods. Uh, and, and so there might be a bit of um, hypocrisy there, uh, certainly um, a nod to gluttony. Um, because he, he has like, you know, he's eating really fine foods and he wants, you know, he doesn't mind talking to people about it. Um, he owns several good hunting dogs and horses and even these dogs and horses have like bells and stuff on their saddles and that's considered to be just you know a very fancy and elaborate so it's just another way where um you're questioning how he has the money for all this if the church is 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 doing what they uh claim to believe which is you know all things to god then we have the friar now, I want to explain to you, friars typically were out in rural com communities that were away from, you know, the main, uh, we'll call it city uh, of an area. Um, they are sort of like the uh, access to confession and, and sermons when you can't go into the big church. Um, and so he was... Um, considered to be a matchmaker and he helped many you know girls get married but not before he ended up having affairs with them and so you know he would even give them like little silver pocket knives and stuff um like little trinkets so um that seems a little obviously hip um hypocritical um but anyway, he would listen to confessions um, and give them a pardon based on who had like, or the best pardon based on how much money he got. He didn't really want to help ill people. He really was, he was in a bar a lot. He, you know, he was very much uh, a fan of mead. Um, he's just, he seems to be, Mm. He seems to be definitely um, lustful. Um, he is cunning because he notices when people have a problem, a religious problem, and he uses that to get money out of them. Um, but the biggest fault he has is that he will, you know, convince girls to have an affair with him and get them pregnant and then find them a husband even though he had impregnated them. So that's kind of uh, terrible. <laughs> All right, moving on. You have the merchant. Uh, the merchant is, when it says he was shrewd, means um, he was a you know, very good businessman, okay? And he knew how to make a good bargain. He is a very, you know, controlled person. He is pretty serious and um he's impressive because he knows a lot 
about um, business. He has a forked beard. That means it's got like two points coming down. Um, when it says he ha it says he has a motley dress, which just just means that it was like multicolored. There was a pattern. There was some kind of design on his robe. Um, he wears he wears a beaver hat, and he has very nice like boots. Um, very expensive. Um, the irony of this guy is that while he has all of this business knowledge, he is deeply in debt. So he doesn't take care of to listen to any of his own advice. Then you have the clerk, um, or sometimes referred to as the Oxford cleric. This is really a student. Okay. This person, um, <clears throat> He is extremely thin, and so is his horse. His horse is very, very thin. Um, and his clothing is what, what's called threadbare, which means it's coming apart. It's coming unraveled. It's got holes in it. Um, he was a student at Oxford, and he at first started to head toward, um, you know, the church, being part of the clergy, but he didn't want to have to live that life, so to speak. Um, so he decided to study philosophy at Oxford. And so he, because he doesn't really fit in with the church and he doesn't really fit in, you know, with the common people, he's kind of like in this group all to himself. Um, he spends every bit of money that he comes across on books. And he has stacks and stacks and stacks of books. He doesn't really want to work. He really depends on the kindness of other people. Um, he seems to be admirable uh, to some degree because of his quest for knowledge. But I, 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 won't, I will disagree somewhat with um, this presentation saying that it, he was along with the night. Um, I really think that his biggest um, vice is really going to be maybe being slightly slothful. He would rather be poor and not feed his horse and take care of those things uh, and read books than he would to work. So he does have some flaw. You have the sergeant at law. This is basically like a lawyer or attorney. Um, he was known to be one of the best around. Um, he could remember details of all kinds of um, cases, I guess you could say, and of the law. He uh, definitely is good at making himself seem to be much busier and wiser than he actually is, <laughs> which that's funny. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he, um, he has... Like I said, he has a, a great memory. He's very well spoken, you know, because he's memorized so many cases and all that. Um, he was very, uh, like, a very distinct person. Um, he had lots of robes and ties, right? He had, like, very, he was very well dressed, very nice looking, very well kept. Um, but anyhow, he even would you know, try to help settle things, but definitely at a cost. Then we have the Franklin. This is a landowner, right? Remember we talked about the, the wealth, you know, the wealthiest of people were landowners, okay? So definitely this guy would have been um, of noble birth. Uh, he definitely spent money freely. <laughs> he enjoyed good food and wine and good company. Um... He carried around um, a dagger and, a, like, a white coin purse that was made out of pure silk. Um, he really is all about enjoying the finer things in life. He always has the best food. He always has the most of it. Um, you know, it says he would sop his cake with wine in the morning. So, definitely this fella um, is going to represent sort of the idea of gluttony, the overindulgence of finer things, not just food, but wine as well. Um, he's very well liked, though. Uh, very well liked. Um, 
he he seems to be a, a jolly fellow, um, and he has a lot of parties, and he serves a lot of fine foods, spends a lot of money. Um, so, party guy, definitely. Uh, one of those guys that's older men that might be, like, fun to be around, that's always, you know, got a nice bow or something like that. We would equate that in our life, right? Who has plenty of money and, and likes to have company. But definitely this is going to lean more toward the gluttonous side. Then you have a group called the Guildsmen. Um, that's because uh, they, together they make a guild. Um, there's a typo on the screen, so don't, I'm sorry about that. But anyway, um, they are basically tradesmen. And they, they are the haberdasher, the dyer, the carpenter, the weaver, and the carpet maker. Okay? Um, and so they all travel as a group. Um, and just, just to make sure that, that you know, haberdasher is someone who makes hats. So just in case you don't know that. Um, but they are dressed according to their profession. They have really, uh, nice tools. You can see that they take care of things like that. Um, they're all concerned with appearance. This is definitely where I'm going to say you would see, like, where we see a middle class that is trying to emerge, right? We talked about the Black Plague and how that sort of, um, changed the social structure and economy in a big way because a third of the population died. And these are people who definitely have benefited from that uh, and now have a, a pretty decent amount of money. Then you have the cook, and he travels uh, with the guildsmen as their cook. Um, but he is a, a well-known cook. Um, because he's so good at it. He has um, a lot of popular dishes um, that are really just great, like impressive to people. Um, however, he has this gross running sore on, the sh on his shin, uh, one, on one of his legs, um, and it's kind of gross because he compares it to the sauce uh, in the chicken pie, which we, I guess we would call a chicken pot pie at this point. Um, and he seems disgusted by it. Um, but I think that's because he, like, he's just sort of indicting his, like, hygiene, right? He seems to be pretty, um, you know, gross. Um, but anyway, he knows a lot about cooking and he does it well. Then you have the shipman. Uh, sometimes this is called the skipper. In our book, it would definitely be called the skipper. But anyway, um, you can kind of equate him to somewhat of a pirate, okay? Um, he doesn't have very good manners. That's what it means by being uncouth. He was a big man. He was a master of the ship and navigating the stars and all that stuff. He knew all the ports, and he, you know, he could fight really well, Um he did not ride well, though, on the horse. He looked really awkward on the saddle, which stands to reason since he, uh, you know, was mostly on the sea. Anyway, um, he, he had a beard, and his face was uh, sun-browned, so definitely tan again. Um, he has a woolen knee-length gown that he wears, so like a robe that's like wool uh, and knee-length. And he wears a dagger. Um, he kind of has this idea, um, of, you know, take no prisoner kind of thing. So he's definitely one of those fellows that would make you walk the plank, okay? Then you have the doctor, and really it's of physic, which basically means that, um, he was an expert in medicine and watched the stars as, as well. Um, he also had knowledge of nature and bodily humors. Um, everything that he does, um, is in cahoots with the druggist. So I want to explain that to you. The druggist is like someone who would have all of the medicines, the pharmacist, okay? So ironically, this is like the first part where you will see that you have to get, 
um, like if, if there was something wrong with someone, the doctor, he would say, oh, well, you need to go to the druggist and you need to get this. And so this is really the first part where you see in literature that someone has to go to a doctor before they can get a prescription. Uh, that's That idea really um, is noted in this story. Um, he is definitely a man of science. He's going to mostly quote medical authorities and rarely quote the Bible. He is very wealthy because of the plague because he is not willing to do it without money. He will not help you without money whatsoever. He will not trade. He loves gold. Um, he has a lot of money, but he does not spend a lot of money. So he definitely is not the kind of people... Um, or the kind of you know, the kind of person that would be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna help you out because you know our our world is in such a bad state. No, he's he wants money. Um, it's it's odd because his uh, clothes are described as being bright and deep red, and that that seems to be ironic, seeing as how um, it's like the color of blood. And you got to remember there wasn't a whole lot of colored clothing during this time, so that would definitely have stood out. Then you have the wife of Bath. Um, she's an excellent seamstress, seamstress and weaver. She makes a lot of colorful scarves, and she covers herself a little bit <clears throat> in all these colorful scarves. She's partially deaf, so she she talks really loud. Um, <clears throat> she will, she always like wants attention. It seems she's like she wants people to notice her. Um, she will definitely make a, a big deal about like offering money to the church and you know it's a big ordeal um she wants people to notice she wears um bright red stockings and like again those colorful scarves um she's been married five times and she's been on many trips like this many pilgrimages and she is gap tooth and is loves to like laugh and act like she knows a lot of things um, just kind of like, a, I think some people probably are maybe off put, you know, off put by her or put off by her, uh, socially. Um, she, they just, she's like the, a loud older lady who thinks she knows everything, I guess you could say. Um, okay. The next one is the parson. Um, this man was poor but holy minded he tried to live and teach the perfect life and he truly did try to practice what he preached um he is the ideal portrait of what a christian priest should be because that's what a, the parson is um he's a parish priest but and while he's well educated he is devout in his belief he is generous and humble and hard working his brother is the plowman who is someone who come, you could hire to come and plow up your farm. Um, he, you know, rides an old mare. He, he doesn't um, really have fancy clothes. He's rather poor, rather a humble person. But he loves God with all his heart. He pays his tithes to church. He's always honest. Um, he's just another example of a, an ideal Christian. Um, and it's no surprise that it, he's his brother is the plowman. I mean, the parson. Sorry. Then you have the miller. He's a big guy, a big stout guy. Um, definitely could, you know, out-wrestle any man. He was broad and thick. Um, he's a redhead. He's got a red beard. And he has a wart on his nose uh, that makes him look kind of scary. He plays the bagpipes. Um, at one point it says his mouth is like a furnace. And if you know what a furnace is, then you know that it's giving out hot air. And we have an expression that says they're full of hot air. So he's just always running off at the mouth. Um, he's the person who would mill grain. So when you bring grain to him, he would mill it and then he would weigh it. And either pay you for it or or what have you. Or you, you know, will pay him if you didn't bring your own. And he would sometimes put his thumb on the scale to to make people have to pay more. So he's kind of a cheater. Then you have the manciple. Um, this is a, a guy who is basically like a house parent at a law school. Okay. 
He takes care of all the students at a law school in London, and he's in charge of purchasing the food. He, while he's not as educated as the lawyers, he's very smart in buying the food so that he able is able to set aside money for himself. So he like charges them X amount, or or the school does, and he's charged with getting them food, and he makes really good deals so that he can keep the extra. And he's also pretty smart with the law just from having been around them, even though he's not educated in the law. Then you have the Reeve. This is a person who manages a large estate. Okay. Um, he has a close cut beard and a short haircut um, that accentuates his thinness and his long legs. Um, he is able, he is efficient, and he is shrewd, meaning like really smart and a no fuss, no muss guy who takes care of things. Um, and he gets rewarded. He knows if anybody has is not being as productive as they should be or producing as much or, you know, doing their work or giving as much money out of something. Um, <clears throat> he is definitely um, running the place. For sure. However, he, like the, like the, um, like the Mansimal, Mansiple, he has put away money for himself, um, or the steward. I should have called him the Mansiple earlier, the guy at the law school. Anyway, um, he does the same thing he does is put money away for himself. He tries to make good bargains and good deals to keep a little money for himself. Then you have the summoner. He's described as being ugly and scary looking. He's the person who go gets people who are deemed to be sinners, and he brings them to church to go on trial. Um, he has a fire red complexion, meaning like just bright red face. Um, he has pimples and boils. Um, it's He's got dry skin. It's scaly around his eyebrows. Um, it says he has a moth-eaten beard. It's just not, it's very well, not, not well kept up. Um, children are afraid of him. Um, he kind of has sores that he treats like leprosy, but he loves strong flavored food and he's easily bribed. Um, he, it's like that he's ugly on the outside um, and that should match the inside because he's corrupt. And then you have the pardoner and this is the guy who has the ability to pardon people of their sins. But what he does is he says, hey, if you want to go out and sin, that's fine with me. I'm just going to charge you a fee called an indulgence and then I'll let you off. But um, so this is really a this is really a problem with Chaucer. It's like giving people permission to sin. But anyway, he has a loud, high pitched voice. Um, he's got blonde hair, and he's not able to grow a beard. He can sing and preach and make everyone buy pardons from him. He's really good at convincing them to get some. But he's one of the most corrupt churchmen that we meet, and he easily confesses being a hypocrite. It's no problem to him at all. Then you have the host who's telling the story. His name is Harry Bailey. And he's just a, a, a merry man who likes good company and good stories. Uh, he is a large and jovial man and is well-liked. Okay? Um, we are going to pick a couple of stories to read. Um, one is going to be called The Pardoner's Tale. And one is going to be called Is the Wife of Bath's Tale. And those are two of the characters. And then we're also going to have a choice of being able to read Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And um, that is not the story that the knight told, but it's a story about a knight. And I thought it would be good to include that as well. So go ahead and pause. If you have any questions, find me in class or message me through the Weebly page.